Welcome to Around BCC, I'm Keith Thibault. We've entered the month of May, the final month of the 2010-2011 academic year at Bristol Community College. Even though we're preparing to wrap up another successful year, we're also taking time to look at what's to come. The economic struggles facing national, state, and local governments have been well documented in recent months, and BCC has done a great job in limiting the impact of the budget shortfall storm. When the new school year begins this summer, students will be faced with needing to help the college make ends meet. The administration at Bristol Community College has done its best to keep the cost of attending the college as affordable as possible. But with an impending state budget crisis on the horizon, the college could not hold the line for the 2011-2012 academic year. BCC has announced an increase of student fees of $20 per credit, beginning with classes this summer, raising the cost per credit from $146 to $166. President Dr. John Sprague says the unfortunate decision comes on the heels of assistance to keep fees this year at 2009 levels. The governor came uh, and the commissioner of higher education and the secretary of education came to uh, participate in the announcement that we would not raise fees and we would not have any layoffs. Uh, we're still uh, not going to have any layoffs uh, next year, but uh, the fees, unfortunately, the, with the stimulus money lost, $1.2 million in stimulus money was lost. And in addition, we're facing, although it's not set yet, but we're facing up to 8.3% uh, cut in our budget uh, at Bristol Community College from the state. President Sprague says that the fee increase will be combined with ongoing efforts to make savings in other areas of the college's budget. Well, our sustainability efforts, our efficiencies, uh, they continue and they're an ongoing process whether we had a lot of money or, or not much money at all uh, because we want to have the most efficient operation we can possibly have at the college. Money saved uh, would be well spent in other priority areas as well as uh, uh, you know, things that we do and in new initiatives and uh, programs for the college. So um, we're going to continue with the, uh, what we've been doing and uh, hope uh, there will be other opportunities for savings as well. In recent years, BCC has seen an increase in enrollment which has bolstered the college's coffers. President Sprague fears this trend may not continue. Enrollment is beginning to level off across the uh, state uh, at community colleges and in education in general. And we have a population, the demographic uh, data suggests that we could be looking at more level uh, enrollment instead of the wonderful increases that we've enjoyed. Uh, we still have a dire need for education in our region in southeastern Mass, but um, the population is, is not, it's not uh, plummeting, but it, there is a gradual decline, and uh, so the student enrollment uh, will also be a factor here. BCC student trustee Chris Wilbur says the increase in fees is not good news for the student population, but he says most students realize that shared responsibility is needed to keep BCC's quality of education at a high level. I think that's my personal um, interest that the quality stays the same and I think we have great quality here. Um, as for students, I haven't posed that specific question but it's a very interesting one. If they had a less quality product at a cheaper price, um, I'm not sure. But I, I know if from a student trustee's perspective, looking on the inside, we have lots of great people employed here doing great things with students every day. So it's hard for me to um, see it uh, from that perspective to cut, cut those fundings and to take that quality away because it's such an invested community. President Sprague is confident that despite budget cuts and fee increases, the students in BCC will not see a negative impact on the quality of their education. The quality will be the same uh, and continue to be excellent. We're adding positions, we're adding programs. We have our uh, e-health program, we have a paralegal program, uh, certificate and degree, a number of sustainability uh, academic programs. So uh, we're moving forward and we're hiring people uh, to make sure that the quality is exactly what we expect at BCC. As we head toward the end of another academic year, those leaving BCC will likely continue their educational pursuits at another college or university. And most will do so with the benefit of having the credits earned here transfer seamlessly to their new institution. BCC recently released its latest data on transfer students and for 2010, 849 students transferred from BCC to another institution. That number is up from 812 students in 2009 
and 643 in 2008. Director of Transfer Affairs Eileen Shea says the increase can be attributed to the college's dual enrollment program, as well as an increase in traditional college-age students who enroll at BCC for financial reasons. Even though most of the students transfer to other state institutions, more are finding opportunities at traditionally more prestigious schools. Besides the quality education that they get here at BCC, I mean, our graduates are really very well prepared to apply and get accepted to some of these really highly competitive, prestigious institutions. And, and these institutions are coming on campus and are recruiting our students because they're very good students. They're very well directed. They have a proven track record. You know, their transcript obviously shows that they're high achieving students. Um, and, and they offer our students some really generous scholarships. This year, uh, last year rather, we had 20 percent of our students have attended private um, four-year institutions. And last year, our transfer students received over $600,000 in merit scholarships to these institutions. And I think it's important to distinguish between merit and need. These are not need-based scholarships. These are based on merit. So they're, they're actively recruiting our students. Even though the numbers are encouraging, Shea says there are still challenges in devising transfer articulation agreements with some schools. Developing an individual program-to-program -program articulation has a lot of challenges. I mean, you know, you're talking about getting the faculty and staff from two institutions together to sit down and kind of negotiate and hash out the content of courses and the content of program and that's challenging enough. Then once the agreement is put into place, you have to market it, you have to advertise it to students and advisors, make people aware of the agreement and you know probably the most difficult thing to do is to keep it up to date and to keep it current because once it's done you know people kind of put it on the website and it's out there but as programs change and curriculum changes you know the agreements have to be changed. Shea says it's never too early for a student to start thinking about transfer options during their years here at BCC. She encourages students to visit the Transfer Affairs Office or their program advisor for more information. With the myriad of options the public higher education system in Massachusetts offers its students, there's still a problem with how the system is perceived in the community. Well, the state has set up a plan on how to promote the good work of public higher education with the goal of making it a model for the rest of the country. Massachusetts Higher Education Commissioner Dr. Richard Freeland has spearheaded what's called the Vision Project, a program geared at improving the quality of public higher education across the Commonwealth. Dr. Freeland says much of what drives the project is a desire to bring more attention to the importance to the great work being done at the state's 29 institutions of higher education and to generate community and financial support for its future. The premise of the Vision Project is not that we need a lot more money right away. We certainly do need more money and I'd love to have more money. But the Vision Project is also about how can we demonstrate that the, the, the public and the legislature should want to give us more money because of our importance and because of the quality of what we do. So the Vision Project is asking us to raise our sights, to become more accountable, to focus on things that matter for the state, and then trust that as times get better, as more financial capacity returns to state government, that that will be reflected in greater investment in public higher education. Dr. Freeland says private colleges and universities are getting their fair share of attention on their quality of education. But he says as more Bay Staters attend public colleges and universities, it's important that they be considered on par with their private counterparts. We need support from the business leadership. We need support from the civic leadership. We certainly need support from the governor and the legislature. But above all, we need a citizenry that cares about public higher education that appreciates its importance, that understands that the future of this state depends on excellence in public higher education. And as the broad citizenry comes to understand that and get that message and reflect it in word and deed, I think we'll see a different story uh, in terms of, of uh, political and legislative support. Dr. Freeland says the early results of the Vision Project have been positive.
we're, we're well into the first year of the Vision Project. Just last month, the Board of Higher Education voted to increase the requirement for high school graduates seeking admission to our four-year institutions to require four years of mathematics rather than three years of mathematics. That was one of the goals of the Vision Project. Uh, the Board of Higher Education will be voting in June on uh, to set targets for graduation rate improvement for our, uh, our different segments in public higher education. So we are already into implementation. Uh, but this is not the work of six months. It's not the work of one year. This is going to take a number of years for us to reach the level of excellence that we want to reach. But our goal is to be a national leader with respect to public higher education. Dr. Freeland says what has been encouraging is the support for the Vision Project that's come from the diverse populations of the state colleges and universities. Massachusetts uh, is composed of uh, many parts and each of our campuses has its own personality and its own integrity and its own point of view. Uh, and yet I have found that despite the highly decentralized nature of our public system, that we are all educators together, that we all share the same goals, which is the success of our students, and that there's a readiness that if the things we can do together to improve uh, our effectiveness campus by campus by campus, that we're ready to come together to do that. So I've been encouraged by the readiness of people all over the public system, despite our highly decentralized system, to get behind the Vision Project and get behind these goals. Despite the financial constraints facing the Commonwealth, Governor Patrick has allocated an additional $7.5 million for the Vision Project in his 2012 budget. Even though Massachusetts appears to be recovering from the current recession faster than the rest of the country, the number of unemployed in the South Coast has held steady. That's why Congressman James McGovern sponsored four events around his district on how local job career centers can help people get back to work. BCC campuses in Attleboro and Fall River played host for two of Congressman McGovern's job resource fairs for those in our region who are unemployed or underemployed. Congressman McGovern says it's important for the government to connect those out of work to tools to get them back on the job. People in their mid-50s and early 60s and some of them have worked at the same job all their life. They never, and they've never been on an interview. They're not quite sure how to put a resume together. And some people aren't aware of their own skills. They can't appreciate, you know, it's, it's one thing for me to say, you know, you're good at this, you're good at that. But when, it's, when you talk about yourself, it's a lot more difficult. And so these career centers have helped, you know, people put their resumes together, understand their skills, and, and actually help them get prepared for interviews and send them to interviews. But look, the goal here is to put people back to work. You want to solve our, our nation's problems, it's jobs. You want to reduce the deficit, put people back to work. They'll pay taxes, you, can re you pay down the deficit. I mean, you want to you know, strengthen our, our national security, it's jobs. It's jobs, jobs, jobs. McGovern says the Republicans in power in the House of Representatives in Washington are looking to reduce the federal deficit on the back of these local career centers. And that's just wrong. People need help. Uh, you know, when you lose a job, it's awful. I mean, I, 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 uh, we've all lost jobs in our, in our lifetime. It does, it's not a good feeling. And, you know, when you're in the middle of your career and you lose a job and you have a family to support, I mean, you, you, it just, it's depressing. Um, and sometimes you don't know what to do. And it is important that we support these programs that, you know, help people get back on their feet. I mean, I, I don't know why in the world we're cutting there when we could be cutting, you know, a tomahawk missile or ending these wars or, you know, why the hell we're giving taxpayer services to oil companies is beyond me. But don't cut programs that actually help people get back to work. McGovern says the reason BCC was selected to host these resource fairs is the role it plays in developing the local workforce. Bristol Community College is part of the solution uh, in terms of getting people back to work. Oftentimes people need additional education. Uh, they need additional skills. A lot of that happens right here on this campus. Uh, there are people who um, have all kinds of challenges that uh, they need to, de to deal with. And again, this is a place uh, you know, where that, that works hand in hand with the Career Center, that works hand in hand with those of us in government to try to make sure that they're responding to the needs of the population. Congressman McGovern is hopeful that as more people get jobs through the help of local job career centers, pressure will be put on the powers in Washington to continue 
to fund these programs. One of the cultural institutions at Bristol Community College recently celebrated a milestone. 2011 is the 25th anniversary of BCC's Theatre Rep. BCC Theatre Rep Artistic Director Rylan Brenner says being at the helm of the program for 25 years has been a, quote, great journey. He came on board at a time when the theater at the Jackson Arts Center was barely being used and students were looking for direction. So when I was hired, I was hired to create a full-time program. Um, I had, right when I got here, I had five students who were uh, a little disgruntled because the person before me who was doing plays uh, was using a lot of Fall River th uh, theater people from outside the school and the students wanted to be represented uh, and they wanted to get some more um, important parts on the stage and roles on the stage. So they hired, they finally decided they needed a theater director who could found a theater program. So I came from Boston and uh, I was the first person to get the keys to the theater beside uh, the people who worked backstage. And um, we started from there. Brenner says his philosophy has been to teach theater as a language, to address our place on this world, and to do so in many ways. I see my job here as kind of um, opening students to a form that they don't know about. Mm -hmm. they, they come here, most of them, knowing what high school musicals are about and things they see on television and occasionally musical theater they see in like the, the local big theaters that, that house the, the traveling shows for Broadway. So they don't really have an, uh, an, an exposure to the kind of theater we do. And you know, I bring in puppets and masks and, and um, all kinds of multimedia uh, um, uh, possibilities for them to use. And so I see that expanding. Brenner says through the years, the methods and tools of teaching theater may have evolved but the theater student has remained the same. It's like directing the same company. They were all there when I direct. All my students are there. All my students um, now are as talented as my students were at the beginning and vice versa. And it seems to me that there is a consistent level of spirit and talent that I am pleased to work with. Brenner says the success of the first 25 years of BCC Theater Rep has not come without its challenges, and his approach for the next 25 years will remain the same. The future is never predictable, and that's what's exciting about it. When I do a new play, I don't know what I'm doing until I'm in it. So when I'm going into the next part of my teaching here, I don't know what I'm going to do until I'm in it. So I can't really predict 25 years from now. I could say the world is changing very rapidly. BCC Theatre Rep just completed its spring schedule with the production of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Happy anniversary again. BCC Theatre Rep is celebrating its 25th year while another artistic initiative is in its infancy, the Bristol Community College Chorus. Adjunct Professor of Music Alan Perlmutter was approached last year by Academic Vice President Dr. Sarah Garrett about creating a choral program for Bristol Community College. Initially, the intention was to form a campus chorus, but it soon evolved into the development of a dedicated course. And the idea of the class is that uh, participants can take it for one credit, uh, or they could take it as an auditor. Um, so the idea is to, to also capture the college and community that can join the group and enjoy it as a community college experience, but it could be taken for one credit. Now this, this year, um, right now, the makeup of the group, uh, albeit it's small, but we're starting to sing in harmony now, and, and that's really exciting. Perlmutter says there are nine students in the current choral class, but when it comes to a successful chorus, quality trumps quantity. Well, it's not really a matter of the largest, the num numbers in the group. I mean, even with 12 singers, you can do really nice things. So it's not a matter of having a large group, but it's a matter of having balances in terms of the voice parts, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And there shouldn't be one person on a part. So ideally 12 people, or even if it was 15 people, but if we have each of those voice parts represented uh, with some experience, uh, then, then we can have some really terrific things happening. 
Perlmutter hopes to have a choral presentation for the community as early as later this spring. The choral classes are offered each semester on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. at the Fall River campus, and there are openings for the class that will begin later on this fall. It's now time to profile a successful graduate of Bristol Community College in our Alumni in Your Community segment. Hi, I'm Cheryl Blackburn. I'm a BCC graduate, class of 1982. I grew up in Fall River, um, down the south end of the city, um, a little street called Grinnell Street. Um, I grew up in a middle class family, my mother and my father and a, a younger sister, only by 14 months. My father was a police officer in the city of Fall River, and my grandfather was a police officer in the city of Fall River also. Um, I went to William S. Green School, a little community school. I ended up um, going to Henry Lord back in the day. Um, I also uh, ended up at um, Durfee High School. In Durfee High School, I actually took uh, secretarial science. And the reason I took secretarial science is I think I was almost pushed into it because back then uh, women should have been secretaries so f in those kind of days. And I think our counselors, if you weren't an all-A student, kind of pushed you towards the secretarial science of being in a secretary. Once I graduated from Durfee High School, I actually applied to Bristol Community College. Um, I wanted to be a secretary. Um, back then, they had an uh, associate's degree in secretarial science, they called it back then. I applied. Um, I was accepted, but I was put on a waiting list. They had a lot of people applying. So in the meantime, I applied to Diamond Regional Vocational High School. They had a postgraduate school, um, and I got accepted there. And what happened is that uh, four weeks um, before school was to start at uh, Diamond, I did get a call from BCC. But I was already committed to Diamond, and I figured it kind of put a financial burden on my parents. So I decided to go to Diamond because because I was a city resident, it didn't cost anything to go to Diamond. So I ended up going to Diamond, and it was a great course. I mean, you know, they prepared us for uh, um, all kinds of things. So once I graduated from Diamond, I actually ended up with my first job at St. Anne's Hospital in the personnel department, and I worked there for about three years. Um, from there, I um, got married, had a baby, and um, stayed home as a homemaker um, for about uh, a year and a half. Unfortunately, after a year and a half, um, I ended up um, having a divorce. And I ended up uh, getting on the welfare rolls, to tell you the truth, back then. There were a lot of opportunities that welfare back then gave us, and one of the opportunities was to go to school. And that's what I did. I actually applied to BCC, um, got grants. Um, my daughter was actually accepted at a um, daycare program that, you know, the BCC actually, uh, not BCC, that the welfare actually paid for back in those days. And I decided to go to school full time. Um, I knew I would have ended up getting a job if I didn't go to BCC because I was a good typist, but I just didn't want that minimum paid job. I wanted to get a degree. I wanted a degree behind me to get a little more for me and my daughter to, to make a better life for ourselves. Graduated from BCC. Um, I was at BCC, matter of fact, and my father, who was a police officer, uh, gave me a call and said there was a job posting at the courthouse. And I said, oh, I can't apply for that. That's um, civil service. And he goes, ah, oh, I don't think it's civil service. And I said, OK, I'm going to run down there. I'm going to go apply for it. And I did. I applied for it. And I um, uh, graduated and started like two weeks after I graduated here at, uh, at, uh, B at uh, the courthouse. I noticed there was a lot of opportunity here. Um, in the courthouse. There were a lot of positions available um, that you could move up in. And I felt that the reason you could move up in is, is there was a, they looked for people who put their good foot forward and were good workers. And there was a lot of potential to get a better job. I also understood that a lot of these jobs, you, had to, you needed a degree to get the jobs. Okay, um, Not only did you need the degree, I just felt that by going back to BCC, because I wanted to go back to BCC for criminal justice. Again, I came here as a secretarial science person. I did not want to work at a desk being a secretary per se. I wanted to be more, whether it would be a probation officer, um, a magistrate, um, something along that lines. In order to get those jobs, I mean, you needed a degree. Um, so I actually went back to BCC, um, enrolled in the criminal justice program took uh, one to two classes a semester. I mean, that was it. I mean, that's all I could do. Again, I was a single mom. Um, I had to find babysits, babysitters in the evening. Um, fortunately, the juvenile court system, um, working for the state of Massachusetts, allowed you to go to community colleges, and they would pay for your tuition. Um, they wouldn't pay for your books or anything like that. But you know, even that back then, the books were expensive. But the big expense was the tuition, and all you had to do is you know get a waiver, and, and they would actually pay as long as it had to do with what you were working at. So what I was working at was in the criminal justice field, and that's why I wanted to go back into the criminal justice field. After um, completing my courses um, at 
Bristol Community College in criminal justice. Um, I was able to take all those courses that I in criminal justice from BCC and transfer them up to UMass. Um, when I got up to UMass, um, I was a little apprehensive. It was a big school. Um, I was a lot older. A lot of the kids were a lot younger than I was. Um, but it gave me an opportunity to um, to see that there was more out there. I mean, you come into the justice system and you think when you work here that there's only one side of the justice system. You don't see the other side, the person sitting on the, on the other side of that bench or the, uh, in that audience. And I got to see the, pers the perspective of the younger students as far as what they felt about justice and the justice system and you know, how it was being dispensed. And it gave me a different look as far as my job was concerned. Um, I did take one course, two courses. You know, I took a course in the summer. It took me a long time to get my degree. I ended up getting my degree in 2005. At the same time, my daughter was getting her uh, master's degree in 2005 in social work. Um, so we kind of had a party in our backyard together. I started right from the bottom. I was a procedure clerk one. I ended up coming over to the um, clerk magistrate's department because in the probation department I had a uh, job that might not have been funded for me at a year. It was like this temporary funding. So there was an opening that came up in the clerk's department and I um, you know, applied for it then. Um, again, I worked for a great man, Ron Arruda. He saw my potential. Um, he, he actually um, promoted me like three other times um, since then. I was um, administrative assistant at first, then I was a head procedure clerk. I was an assistant clerk magistrate. Um, and then when the first assistant clerk magistrate retired, um, I was offered the position by Mr. Ruta. The magistrate has the, um, the power to appoint his first assistant magistrate out of the assistant magistrates. And um, like I said, I worked first as a second secretary um, and, and got promoted all, the, all those years. I got promoted as first assistant and clerk magistrate in 2002, so I started in 1982 here. Um, so it was, you know, it was, an, it was a slow progression, um, you know, but I had a lot of interesting jobs um, while I was in all those fields. I loved going down to the old campus. I mean, it was, it was uh, everybody knew each other, everybody's name. It was, you know, only a couple of secretarial science down there, and I think there was one other program that was down there. So we got to know the teachers, that everyone knew you by your first name, even teachers you didn't take courses from. Um, so it was, it's, it was a small little quaint kind of, uh, it didn't have that college, big college atmosphere, so it wasn't so intimidating um, from somebody who was a little afraid, um, didn't know if they were gonna make it, didn't wanna fail. Um, and you know, in, in BCC, I think, uh, really helped you. I mean, everybody was there from uh, guidance counselors. If you had a problem, you could go to anyone. And, you know, and, and it was a great community college. I mean, you didn't feel, you felt like you belonged. Um, I really did feel like I belonged at, at BCC. Some other news and notes now from around BCC. Being that we're in May, next on the BCC calendar is the 2011 commencement exercises. This year's celebration is set for Saturday, June 4th at 11 a.m. at the Fall River campus. The commencement can be seen live on Fall River Community Television, Channel 95 on the Fall River Comcast cable system. It will also be streamed live on the FRC-TV website at frctv.org. The academic year may be over later this month, but the summer semester is right around the corner. Check out the BCC website for a full list of credit and non-credit offerings. That's all for Around BCC this month. We leave you today with a look at the student juried exhibition of student artwork at the Grimshaw Goodowitz Art Gallery. I'm Keith Tebow. Have a great summer. We'll see you in September.